Make it, make it, do it, makes us. Hi, my name's Samantha Uttleman. And I'm Madeline Hicks. And we're both seniors at Aspen High School. And we are both a part of the IB Diploma Program, which requires the completion of a CAS project, which stands for Creativity Activity Service. And we collaborated with Peter DeWetter, a fellow IB Diploma candidate, to create this documentary. Hello, my name is Peter DeWetter, and I am also an IB Diploma candidate here at Aspen High School. Initially, Sam and Maddie approached me asking for my guidance in creating a documentary for a CAS project. Instantly, I said yes, given my passion for broadcast journalism, as well as my prior experience on the Skier TV team, which is Aspen High School's broadcast program, as well as my experience working at the Snowmash Chapel on the audio and visual team. After outlining the project, we had a good idea of how we wanted to bring our ideas to fruition. However, I will say shortly after we started production, I quickly realized the amount of technical problems as well as time the project would truly entail. I also want to give a huge shout out and express how grateful I am to Sam and Maddie as well as all the other amazing people who gave their time to speak with us because it made the entire process a really fun collaborative experience which also gave me the opportunity to build on my videography, editing, and directing skills which I hope to carry over and study in college. So thank you very much and please enjoy. When I was 14, I tore my ACL for the first time when I was in a Super G race here at Aspen Highlands. I didn't know what was happening. I didn't know what was going on. I refused to get surgery and I ended up getting surgery, but it was just, it was so hard for me to go through as a 14 year old. And I didn't know a lot of people around me that had gone through an experience like mine. So it was hard for me to find the support and have people kind of like relate to me. I was a ski racer for 11 years of my life until my sophomore year when I tore my ACL and meniscus skiing at Highlands, my home hill. Throughout my injury, I felt that I didn't really get any mental support. I didn't have anyone that was really, you know, understanding of the mental aspects that I was going through and all the anxiety that I had. Then in 2021, after my last ski race of the season, I was backcountry skiing and I tore my other ACL. That one was a lot bigger of an injury. I tore my ACL, MCL, PCL, and meniscus. When it first happened, I knew exactly what happened because of my past experience with my other knee. And I was just like so like upset and mad at myself that I let it happen again. And it was also six weeks after my older sister had torn her ACL for the second time. And so I just felt so bad. I didn't know what I was gonna tell my parents. I didn't know what I was gonna tell my ski coaches and I just felt a lot of like pressure on me to be really strong even though like my mental health at the time was just so bad and I, I didn't know how to like cope with what I was going through. I felt that I got some support from my coaches but that was more centered around the physical aspects. I felt that most of my coaches were very focused on you know coming to my physical therapy and making sure that I could do 30 single leg squats or making sure that I could do 30 leg raises, but I felt that there wasn't really anyone that would check in on me mentally and how I was doing with all of the emotions that I was experiencing. I think that my second knee injury was in one way easier because I knew everything, I knew what to expect. I knew just how hard the surgery was gonna be. I knew how the pain meds were gonna be. I knew how the first three months were. And in my opinion, I think those are the hardest months because you're just, you feel like you literally can't do anything. My good friend, Samantha Edelman, she was going through her first knee injury at the time too. And we kind of relied on each other 
to support one another through this time. The reason that we both wanted to create this project is because we felt that there was not enough information given to us after our injuries on how to deal with the mental health aspects of our injuries and the depression and anxiety and everything that we both went through and we kind of just felt like there was no you know information out there kind of highlighting that it's normal to go through all of that and that it's normal to experience all of that and that you can ask for help from your friends from your teammates from your coaches and that was that's really the idea behind this whole project i blew up my knee for the first time when i was 18 and i got a MRSA infection and had all this um extra stuff happen. So it's my third ACO reconstruction, but I, it's my third because I had my second one was because of a, a infection. So same leg, same uh, left knee. I tore my ACL again in October in Austria in Hintertox. Well, I was training for Solden. So the first World Cup Alpine race of the year. And like, yeah, three weeks before, um, it was really, not a big deal. I didn't fall. I fell after I tore everything, but I just made a normal turn and um, just loaded up the ski a lot and you just kind of saw a little twist, but in that twist, I like tore my ACL, I shattered my cartilage and I tore both meniscus, all just like making a very normal turn. And that was very similar to my first ACL as well. You can't even see it on the video. I just felt a pain kind of like skied a couple more gates, kind of stood up and stopped. March 16th, I was training slalom on this hill right here and wasn't even that bad of a crash. Crash, tweaked my knee, felt it. Didn't really know what I felt, but I, I definitely heard a pop. Then I was free skiing over at Aspen Mountain. Um, I went off a jump and landed kind of weird compensating on my left leg and I like landed and tore my other one. Tore my ACL and this past August in Sauce Bay, Switzerland. It was my first one of the day warming up on Super G skis and I kind of leaned in going over a knoll onto this pitch. Um, and when my skis brought me back up, I turned to the right and my skis kind of had the delayed reaction to my knee. And so I think my knee just kind of twisted and popped and then my ACL was gone. I tore my ACL in Panorama, Canada, BC at the Noriam and the conditions were not very good. It was super shady and the snow was chunks. And I was skiing down, hit a compression, lost a little bit of control to try to save myself, lost my outside skiing and then felt my knee buckle in twice and then felt a pop and sat down and was like, yeah, <laughs> that was my knee. Unfortunately, we see a lot of ACL injuries really throughout the year, but for the most part, the highest numbers come in during the winter season. And so in any given day in the ER here at Aspen Valley Hospital, there's at least an ACL injury every day of ski season, sometimes more. Why is it that women are at a higher risk? Well, there's a few things. Some of them are anatomic differences. And so um, one of them has to do with alignment of the lower extremity. And so sometimes women have what's called a, a larger Q angle where they have more of a, uh, a knock knee standing alignment. And so that, that could predispose to ACL risk. Also in general, genetics are, um, a, are definitely a risk factor. And so ACLs tend to run in families and that probably has to do with the way that collagen is organized. Collagen is a structural protein. Um, it's, the, it's one of the major structural proteins, and so differences in collagen uh, could be a contributor, specifically people who you know, are double-jointed or they're, uh, we call that um, joint hypermobile. They just have, they see a little bit more range of motion through their joints, and they could, that could they, be a contributor as well. Do you think there is a reason or cause for this injury, whether it was emotional or physical? I was probably at the strongest I've ever been at that point and potentially put on too much muscle too fast. And maybe my body wasn't used to kind of the new way it was responding, um, especially in a new environment and with speed skis on mentally, honestly, I've kind of always thought about injury and 
in this sport, everyone tears their ACL, everyone has an injury and that's just kind of common knowledge. And so to be honest, I've always thought about like, eventually it will happen. I think it was mostly physical both times because the first time I tore it when I was 18, I had been probably under fueling my body, like not eating enough. And I was in school at the time of skiing for the university of Denver. So I was training on top of classes and school. So I was just really sleep deprived, really not fueling my body, not eating enough. And then this most recent time, actually, I think it was exactly the opposite. So I was like probably 20 or 30 pounds heavier than I usually am. Um, I was just like, you know, training really hard in the gym and like trying to put on a lot of muscle and a lot of weight. Um, and I made like a normal turn, you know, like it was, it was great. It was a powerful, normal turn, but I think just having that little bit of excess weight made it tear. I think a lot of factors went into this injury. I think that I had a poor warm up going into this race and I don't think that my joints and muscles were tech pretty much firing before I was going in and it was negative 10 so a warm up was important. Given how many ACL injuries you've seen, do you think that our warm ups and dryland training actually help prevent them? Yeah, um, I definitely think warm-ups, neuromuscular warm-ups, um, and the biggest one being dry land training, summer strength and conditioning, and then strength and conditioning in season plays a huge role in it. Because um, like I said, that neuromuscular strength level is one of the big factors when you look at ACL tears. The strength and conditioning piece plays a big role in it, but also if you just are able to lift heavy, that doesn't mean necessarily that um, neuromuscular is like the connection between your brain and your muscles. So being able to recruit different muscles at different times is really key because in the situation of a crash or sometime when you might be tearing your ACL, you're trying to recruit all those muscles at the right time to keep it from ha from the force being on the ligament and more be able to handle it with your muscles. What was your initial reaction to your injury? I didn't really have a reaction. I'd say I was, I got to the bottom and we had no idea what was happening. And I was told maybe ACL, maybe MCL, but they had no idea. So I was kind of unfazed until I knew from the MRI. It was kind of just surreal. Like, okay, this happened what's next like it wasn't a lot it wasn't a, an emotional reaction I wouldn't say it was anger or frustration it was more just like almost silence like acceptance of like okay this is the time like I got hurt it's over luckily like I'm okay it wasn't a big crash but I'm done for right now it was mostly fear for the first one for the second one since I had already gone through it I knew exactly what had happened when I heard that pop so I was more just angry I, as soon as it happened, I sat on the chairlift and screamed for like 10 minutes. When I first blew up my knee in October, I was actually so chill and so uh, not very sad at first. I think I was probably in denial for a bit. For me personally, uh, having a spot on the U.S. ski team, like I, I got nominated to the U.S. ski team in April and blew up my knee in October. So that was a huge relief to me just to have the support from the team for the year, even while I was hurt. What was surgery like for you? And what was your relationship with painkillers? So I had surgery about a week after I tore my ACL and it was kind of a weird experience. My sister had torn her ACL three years prior to me doing so. So when I went into surgery, it was kind of a streamlined process. Like my parents had been through this and the doctor was the same surgeon. And so to be completely honest, I kind of felt like I was a bit in the dark through the whole thing. And so at one point, like right before surgery, I, I stopped and I was like, mom, dad, I understand you've been through this process before, but I have not. They expected me to just understand when I was the one who had never actually been through it before. The surgery was super easy. I, it was an hour and a half. I woke up and was like, okay. Um, but the painkillers were actually an issue. I have had a really high tolerance to oxy. And so they didn't really work much for me. So I was taking a, them at the right time and the right amount, but I took them for probably a week and a half, which is a really long time to take them. Mm -hmm. And I was in pain for two weeks, just like couldn't stand, couldn't, like it was like hard to breathe. I was in so much pain. Mm -hmm. 
because the oxy just never really kicked in for me. My first surgery went a lot better than the second one. The second one I woke up from surgery and one of the nerve blocks had been knocked out of place. So I was in a lot, a lot of pain and I woke up um, like earlier than I should have because I was in so much pain and they had to give me like um, some heavy duty fentanyl. Mm -hmm. And I like, kind of remember that night, not really, but I do remember being in a lot of pain and that was pretty brutal. The painkillers, um, honestly I hated them. They made me feel horrible especially the first round. My second surgery was right before I graduated high school and I was writing my valedictorian speech while I was trying to, on painkillers. I remember I'd wake up every night and be like, oh, this is such a great idea and like write all these notes to my phone and then I'd like show them to my dad and my dad would be like, this makes no sense. <laughs> so that kind of shows how like your perception is skewed. This most recent one I had was my 10th knee surgery in like the past four years. So I, I got addicted to my opioids the first time, but it was a much more physical dependence. So when I got off them, uh, it was just a lot. I just felt ill for a couple of days and then it passed. It was very physical. And this time uh, my relationship with them became very mental. So I stopped them and within like 10 hours of stopping them, I started having like really strange like panic attacks. It's, I think it's better to know and better to talk about. I didn't talk about it for a while because no one else in my circle of friends or on the USD team had ever talked about, you know, having an opioid dependence after their surgeries. Did people on your sport help you? Like coaches, teammates? Initially, yes. My coach at the time was very supportive in the beginning, but because it, it's such a long recovery, kind of like titters out, which is hard because the athlete is still dealing with this every single day and other people seem to just move on super quickly. I feel like I kind of lost my like, dynamic with my team and my coaches. So I had a lot of support from my family and my roommates especially, mm -hmm. but I didn't feel as much with my team and coaches like I did before. My teammates during all the surgeries, you know, were there as much as they could be. They were traveling also all year as well. So um, I think after my second one, they were still just happened to all be, you know, in copper and I had all my surgeries in Vail. So they were able to like come see me after and that was amazing. Um, but in reality, you know, the rest of the year they were in Europe it was almost nice to have a little bit of distance from ski racing um, and from them, like even when they're away and traveling, it was almost better to have a little bit of space because it was, it was really hard to see them racing and competing. And I was on crutches for most of the year. It's hard when you're in that scenario, like you're away from your teammates and there's the initial reaction of, oh my God, are you okay? Like everyone reaches out in the beginning, but then there's a, a long time period where people just kind of forget. And it's the ones that have been through it that continue to reach out. And I think that really helped to notice. And someone had said that to me when I first got injured, like, hey, there's going to be a lot of support right now. But in a few weeks, in a few months, when people forget you're injured and you're still injured, not many people will reach out. So you really have to kind of take it upon yourself to do your own advocate, like be your own advocate. Have you noticed any differences in how AVSC handles injuries versus the U.S. or Canadian ski team? At this point, I would say not a whole lot different. I think getting injured, and it really doesn't matter who you are, is a pretty lonely process, and it can be extremely challenging to kind of work through that place where you're not able to do what you enjoy doing, and, and physically you don't feel well, so I think that kind of ties into your mental health. But I've seen the same scenario even at the national team levels. It's difficult. Um, you lose that connection with your team you lose that connection with your coaches to a certain degree and, and it's an important piece of the puzzle and it's but I would also say that that piece has to come from athletes and the people they work with it can't just be sort of thrown in the court of coaches need to be fully responsible for every every everyone's mental health hundred percent I think it's kind of a team a team effort to try and help somebody get back through injury and get back to a place where they're ready to compete. So we know that you experienced an ACL injury um, and from experiencing that, does it help you support athletes who have gone through a similar situation to you? 
the main reason why I have the job I have now is from going through this experience. I tore mine playing soccer in high school and it was the athletic trainer there who kind of diagnosed it and helped me get through that whole process. You know, everyone's different and everyone handles things differently. So it's not, uh, my experience isn't exactly like anyone else's, but mm -hmm. I think it does help to have gone through it and connect with people. What did you do as far as things to help you cope? Um, I feel like it was really important, especially the first time around, because I was so, I loved the sport so much and still want to be involved, was coming here and watching my teammates, still trying to go to the gym and do my physical therapy and just like still kind of try and be a part of the team because I miss that so much. We have such a, we have such an awesome team and our coaches and the girls on it were I miss that a lot. I don't think I coped very well at all. I, my emotions were all over the place. Like some days I'd be like, yeah, I'm gonna kill rehab. And some days I'd be like, I don't wanna touch the gym. I don't wanna touch my knee. Like if it hurt, I'd be like, oh, I'll just give it a day off, but it hurts every day. Like I may have talked about a little bit. I think I was in denial for a while and like just had this, a vision that I would just return immediately and it would be fine and I'd have no pain and like everything would be rainbows and unicorns. It was just a matter of coming to terms with the reality and being a little bit more realistic. All I can do is like go to PT and work hard in the gym and that's all I can do. So I think just realizing that and doing everything in your power is what really helped kind of calm me down and get my emotions a little bit under control about this whole injury. You know, the mental health of athletes when they get injured is definitely a fragile area and it's a big component. Um, in the end, it ultimately it comes down to your mindset and being willing to take challenges and, and, and take on, put yourself in that place where you're willing to take risk. Within our own club, the mental health piece is probably addressed directly by coaches and Aaron's part of that as well. But I would say we can probably do a better job. What were the steps that you took in order to live a normal life again and get back to what you were doing before your injury? I met a ton of new people and made a ton of new friends and got into activities I didn't think I would actually enjoy. Like, I got into rock climbing and now I love rock climbing, but I wouldn't have done that because I didn't have time when I was ski racing. So I was able to pick up new hobbies and meet new people and like kind of get away from just ski racing dynamic and explore like other activities that other people like to do as well. I waited the full nine months before I returned to snow, or I returned to snow at 36 weeks. Mm -hmm. And I would say I took everything else very slowly. I didn't rush, I, ski racing is my only sport now. Um, and so I didn't rush getting back into running or cutting or any of that type of stuff, just because ski racing was my ultimate goal. And I didn't really want to mess anything up prior to then. I started running, I think around five months I started really I think at six months I really started to feel like I could do a bit more but it wasn't until like eight months that I would just kind of trust my knee a bit more and then then I would go you know play volleyball or spike ball or pickleball with my friends um, and then that nine months I skied again and I had a return to snow progression for about 10 days where I took it really easy and I'm now at my first camp where I'm fully back integrated with the group training not taking any really precautions with my knee. How do you think the ski world could better support injured athletes? The coaches that did still include me and still texted me still gave me the time of day when I would come to the mountain and talk to me ask me about my injury how my recovery is going that was just really important because I still feel felt part of the team and felt relevant because you already are losing so much and losing your team and your sport at the same time is really hard. I think dynamic with friends and family and coaches is everything because you want a family behind you but if you don't feel like you have that then the support's minimal and you want all the support you can get because you need it. It's, it's hard. When you're injured, I think it's really easy to look at what everyone is doing wrong and how they're not incorporating you and this and that. Like there's so many things like they could do better. But when you're back on the other side of it and you're the athlete, it's both ways. It's so hard. 
like as a teammate, it's hard to look at an injured athlete and see and know what they want, know if they want you to communicate with them or know if they want you to leave them alone. Like if they like being a part of it or hearing what's going on, or if they would rather not know anything at all. I also think probably the biggest thing they could do better is check in at the times where you don't think to check in. Everyone checks in the beginning, everyone checks in at the end, but it's the middle. It's like the chunk of time where everyone thinks you're okay. You look okay. No one can tell you're injured because you're not wearing a knee brace anymore, but you're, you still can't do everything. By just having a more realistic expectation of the return to snow process. So not expecting us to be super fast immediately, like after a year off of snow, I think it just takes a long, long time to get back and better than you were before. How do you think the club and just like the ski world in general could better support injured athletes? Having athletic trainers in as much ski clubs as possible I think is really helpful and just helping facilitate the process. I often say a lot of my job is an injury liaison. It's really just like <laughs> helping somebody through because it's a lot. And unfortunately, I think no matter what we do, injuries are still gonna happen in ski racing. Um, and so it's just important to have like systems in place to make sure that athletes can, when they are injured, that they can get through the injury and ideally get back to snow if that's what they wanna do, um, get back to ski racing or whatever activities they wanna do. How does the Stedman Clinic prepare athletes to return to sport, both mentally and physically? Really, it starts at the beginning. It's sort of setting expectation that you know this is what you have. Also, sort of getting in depth as far as um, what other additional injuries that could have an impact potentially on the recovery, such as meniscus and other ligaments. As we start getting into the tail end, about six months, that's when we start talking about well, okay, well we're you know potentially three months away from return to snow or um, you know return to sport program, and and we try to prepare you what sort of physical. Uh, tasks and drills that you know we can do to get you ready and so that's that's part one and then usually everyone in our clinic will do a return to sport test and what that is is a um, you know sort of a well-developed series of exercises um, that really is comparing your injured leg to your uninjured leg and so the whole goal of that is to really achieve symmetry because that's when you're going to be at least risk for injuring re-injuring the injured knee or injuring the opposite knee because that's we know now that that's a very big risk factor as well and then a mental piece that's again what's really that's modern research in the last year or so has really touched into that and obviously it's a devastating injury requires a tremendous amount of rehab um, and there's mental trauma and ptsd associated how, however it happened and so that's a big piece and so you may be physically ready but not mentally ready and so now um, there's you know, basically different um, assessments and questionnaires that have been developed that could assess patient readiness, like are they returned? Because when you're ski racing and you're moving at very high speeds and making snap decisions, if there's any mental inhibition, um, you know, you, you could put yourself at risk for another injury. I mean, mm -hmm. you have to look no further than the past right. Olympics when, you, when there's a mental um, sort of inhibition going on, you're, you can't ski to your full potential. If you could go back in time and change everything that happened, would you? If I could go back in time and not tear my ACL, I don't think I would because in the end, there were a lot of silver linings of the timing that I tore my ACL. I was a senior in high school this past year and I was able to be there with my class and kind of have all those little moments that I was never used to having because I was always gone. Um, it made my decision for college and choosing where I wanted to go and how I wanted to, you know, approach skiing for college but also trying to pursue the national team it really helped my decision for that and now I'm able to try and pursue both at once and so honestly like it was really hard but I grew a lot as well this year I think I became a lot more independent and I don't think I would change it yes and no I mean the injury wasn't fun and it's not like the recovery is hard but I wouldn't change who I met and what I did and focus on academics. It was nice to focus on academics and go to class full time. So there's ups and downs for sure. No, I would not change. Maybe this one, I'd change the fact that um, I had to wait like four months for my ACL, but also like, you know what, that's character building. So like, no, I wouldn't.
I wouldn't take them all back. I don't think I'd be nearly as good as I am now without hurting myself that especially that first time this time you know time only time will tell but I do believe that it will be a good thing and um because it just cons I think injury just constantly reminds you of how lucky you are to get to do what you do and Mm -hmm. it brings a whole new appreciation to your sport yeah I would never choose to go through that because it was painful and really made me depressed for a while but I don't know I, I do believe that everything happens for a reason and I feel like if I didn't have these injuries I would be in a very different place in my life because I would have taken a very different path. What advice can you give someone who's going through a similar situation to you? I would say be easy on yourself it takes a lot longer than you think and you can do all the rehab, you can check off everything on the box, but in the end, it really is just time. And there's so much data to support that, you know, the longer you wait to return to snow or whatever sport it is, you know, the less likely you are to re-injure yourself. Don't fight it as hard as it is. Like you're in it and you are gonna be in it for a really long time, but just like putting that, what really helped me was putting all my energy that I had from ski racing into my physical therapy into getting stronger like changing that focus but still having that drive and motivation because it's really easy to just start laying on the couch watching tv and getting sad Mm -hmm. um but still like waking up every day trying to go to the gym trying to get stronger still have that motivation because in the end it will benefit you a lot more and make you happier not to give up and to believe in yourself because the little steps you don't notice much, but in the long run you notice the world difference. Like you'll do your PT and it's, it's so hard for three weeks and then the fourth week you're like, oh, it's actually easier. And so it's like motivation to keep yourself going. I'd say anyone going through a similar situation, you should be kind to yourself and really um, keep it all in perspective. Stay on your grind, keep working hard. Like it's probably gonna be really tough the first year back, but like that doesn't mean that it's not possible. It doesn't mean that you're not gonna make it to where you wanna be. It just means it's gonna take more time. And so as long as you're like committed, no matter the amount of time it takes, um, you're gonna be just fine. Thanks for taking the time to watch our documentary. And we really hope that this documentary can help provide advice for future athletes that may experience something similar to us. Oh